My first guest, Nazanin Bonyadi, was born in Iran and is the star of the hit Lord of the Rings series, The Rings of Power. Nazanin is using her global platform as a voice for the movement and shedding light on how we can help. She joins us now in a daytime exclusive. Please welcome Nazanin Bonyadi. Thank you so much for joining us, because this comes at a risk, a great risk. The Associated Press is reporting that the Iranian government is targeting people like you and other celebrities. They are looking to arrest you, passport confiscation, harassment. Um, we know that there have been allegations of even plots to assassinate people outside of Iran who speak up against what's happening. Are you afraid? Thank you for spotlighting this, Tamron. This means so much to us. I, we all have, we all take a risk in speaking out. Nowhere near as, as big of a risk as people in, inside Iran. Um, the real risk is w when you're inside Iran and you're speaking out. Mm -hmm. Celebrities are constantly being uh, harassed, um, silenced, imprisoned. In fact, just yesterday, I think, a filmmaker, uh, Nick Youssefi, was arrested for making a short video in solidarity with these mm -hmm. protesters. And, you know, I never take my freedoms for granted. I live in a country where I can be here and speak to you all about what's going on in I'm my I'm struck homeland. by you are here showing your shoulders. These are things that we have the ability to do yeah. that yeah. our sisters there cannot. They can't. They don't have the freedom to choose. And I was in Iran. I visited when I was 12. Um, and I was stopped by a morality policeman. What was that like? What, it, what happens it, there? Because the, first of all, help me understand morality police, because in our equivalent of that, I think about like stop and frisk, which thankfully was ended, where people could be stopped and seen as suspicious. Right. That ended here in New York. What is it like for the morality police to be around there? Yeah, I mean, so much of this has its roots in, in it's very similar to the civil rights movement. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing, mor morality police, it's a, it, it, it has nothing to do with morality. It's everything to do with uh, a patriarchal misogyny mm. of holding women, keeping women down. So when I was 12, I'm walking down the street and around with my uncle and my mother is two, three steps behind us and we get stopped and I'm forced to wear a hijab. I wasn't used to it. I had the freedom to choose in London where I grew up. And then I'm forced to wear a hijab and we get stopped and forced, and they, they said, provide marriage certificates because they assumed that myself and my 40, my 12 year old self and my 45 year old uncle were married just because we were walking down the street. This is the type of thing that girls, young girls have to constantly on a daily basis deal with. But it wasn't always like this. So when people say, well, that's that country and that's the, the laws there. We have images that have gone viral from what it was like for women in Iran prior to 1979. Correct. And people have been showing these images where women were able to be educated. They were able to show their faces. And, and this is some of the, the what, what we saw as the real face of Iranian women. You could yeah. wear what you want, you could work. Yeah. And now, obviously, that is not the case. So when people say, well, it's always been like that, yeah. it hasn't. Yes, exactly. So in 1979, there was a revolution and it was an Islamic revolution that basically took away women's rights. It was an anti-woman revolution. And, um, you know, before 1979, women could dress however they wanted. They could become judges. They could assume the highest ministerial offices in the country. They had a right to choose. They, they, the legal age of marriage for women was 18. It got reduced to nine after nine. the revolution. So girls as young as nine could get married. It got raised to uh, 13, I think it was, after a while, but then young, young girls can still get married as young as nine with the permission of their father or a judge. Mm -hmm. And so when you see that women are segregated from men after 1979, women are now segregated from men in the classroom, at the, at the workplace, at beaches, they have to sit at the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. This is gender apartheid. You know, we saw what racial apartheid was in South Africa. This is gender apartheid. Women are second class citizens. They're worth half the value of a man before a court of law. And so that's what we're fighting for is equal rights for women. But more importantly, all of this, Tamron, has sparked a freedom movement. It's, it's to me, it's the first female led revolution of our time, but it's wow. become so much more than that. It's about basic fundamental rights. And these, these, the people of Iran want this theocracy gone. But their lives are in danger right now as we speak. Women are being held in one of the infamous prisons in Iran. Lives are... Uh, hanging in the balance. I'm struck by the fact that you're in one of the biggest 
film projects of the year, but you have essentially stopped for a second um, from that so that you could use your platform to focus on this. When we come back, we'll talk much more about Nazine and how our, this is a huge moment in her career, but she also knows that she cannot silence her voice in an effort to help those who are asking for us to do that now. We'll be right back. And it has become a back and forth, and men and women in Iran are standing shoulder to shoulder, striking fear into the heart of the very regime that has built itself on segregating women and separating Iranian men and women. We will no longer stand for that. We are back with actress and activist Nazanin Bonyadi, who's using her platform as a voice for the courageous girls and women of Iran. We're putting their lives on the line right now. We are live. And Nazanin, that was a rally in L.A. 20,000 people showed up. 20,000, you guys. I mean, so you are, we are seeing the help and support from around the world. But clearly, we're five weeks into this. Yeah. What people are asking, what do we do? I would love for everyone to call their senators. I would like for them to say, please stand with the people of Iran. And what that looks like is we need to call an urgent hearing at the U UN Human Rights Council, and we need to basically have a mechanism in place so that we investigate, report, and hold the Iranian authorities accountable for these human rights violations. Otherwise, what happens is these protests happen. They keep happening. We've had them once a decade since 1999. I covered the Green Revolution. Right. And people thought this was going to be a transformative moment, but the government was able to stop it. Yeah, and we were not vocal enough in our support for mm -hmm. the Iranian people. And this moment is different. This moment, I think we're seeing this global solidarity. It looks a lot like what happened with the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. So you believe this moment is different? I mean, I just saw uh, ABC News, George Stephanopoulos, my colleague, was uh, speaking with Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. And they talk a lot about sanctions. They talk these, the, these things that we've heard before. And I think you can appreciate and understand when people say, OK, these are just politicians talking again. Mm -hmm. Nothing will move the needle. This is a country that it appears that it is unchanging, no matter how loud the voices get. Yeah, I think, Tamron, the thing that's different, I, I actually was recently at the White House, yeah. and I met with the Secretary of State, and I met with the Vice President, Kamala Harris, and I met um, with the, the National Security Advisor to the President, Jake Sullivan, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm hopeful that this time's different. And, you know, when you hear President Obama come out and say, you know, we weren't as supportive as we needed to be of the Iranian people in 2009, and Secretary Clinton said the same thing, that looking back, they wished they had been, you know, stood by the people. That means that we are taking now, we can take a step in the right direction and correct this course that we're on. And I'm hopeful that this administration will do that. I know when you were at Comic-Con, this is a big uh, festival, huge, huge festival, and you dedicated your role in the Lord of the Rings to the Lord of the Rings of Power, excuse me, to the women of Iran. Two months later, we saw this incident. So you've always kept your home and the women there in your heart. What is your dream for the nine-year-old girl right now, the 13-year-old girl right now in Iran? What is your dream, this big star that they look up to oh. in this big film? Tamron, I had no idea when I dedicated this role to the brave women in Iran who are at the forefront of this fight for democracy and freedom for 43 years two months before the murder of Massa Amini, that I would two months later be standing outside the federal building in Los Angeles, speaking to 20,000 protesters, showing up in solidarity with the brave women and people of Iran. This is a global moment, and we, we, can, we need to pay attention to it. We need to stand up and fight for the women and the people of Iran. As young as 11-year-olds are being killed by the security forces. And, you know, enough is enough. I mean, we are, we're a one human family. Mm -hmm. And I think this message has resonated with anybody who cares about bodily autonomy, with anyone who cares about the BLM movement, anyone who cares about civil and human rights. Um, and, and I think that that's everyone across mm -hmm. the world in this moment who doesn't want, freedom is so fragile. Yeah, it and is. we have to hold on to those freedoms mm -hmm. wherever they, they can be protected. Thank you so much for joining us today. Nazanin, of course, you can watch The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power on Amazon. You are an outstanding human being, an amazing actress, a beautiful soul. Thank you so much for joining us.